Well, I can't say I saw this one coming, but Cole Martin is in the transfer portal and it shows why recruiting matters a great deal. Oh, and Brian's got some stories today. Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. So if you have not already, please like, comment, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to or watch this show. Today we have Brian Smith, our Locked On Recruiting Insider here at the network. And this is a move, Brian, that has caught a lot of Duck fans off guard, myself included, by the way, because Cole Martin was one of the earliest commits in Oregon's 2023 class. He's the son of Oregon defensive backs coach uh, Demetrius Martin, or Coach Meat, as he is known. Cole Martin was a stud. I said throughout the year, every time I saw him play, boy, I feel like he can be an all-conference <laughs> caliber guy one day. I still feel that way. Is Cole Martin's departure into the transfer portal an automatic indication to you that his dad could also be on the move from the coaching staff? No. No. So we're talking, number one, we're talking about teenagers. Teenagers and consistency are not friends. So I wouldn't worry about it that much. Um, I, I think it's probably more indicative. I want to be somewhere else. That's the age we're in. There are guys that were semi all conference at places that have been in, like entered the ports. Like, why is this guy doing that all over the country? SEC, Big Ten, et cetera. I've stopped trying to figure that part out. The only thing I'm curious about, and this, this may not be it, Sometimes dad's son, especially when you're at the same spot, may not work. There's a lot of dynamics there. Maybe the locker room, maybe they don't work well together because sometimes dads are really hard on their kid. There's a million possibilities. That is a very unique thing. I, I, I know a couple of people, they had really good kids. Their kid was like, there's zero chance I'm going to play underneath my dad. So everybody's got a different perspective on that, but I wouldn't think it's automatic for the coach to leave. But it certainly is a realistic possibility. It's the first thought that popped into, well, the second thought that popped into my head. The first one was, whoa, is this is this real? Is this really happening? And the second one was, does that mean his dad's on the move as well? Because you would think with that dynamic, of course, you know, Coach Meat having having raised Cole, they would have had a, a, a pretty good idea of what the coach player dynamic would be like at Oregon when Cole committed back then. But do you think that the dynamics can change once – they're both actually in that environment compared to their expectations? Yeah. I mean, you can only prepare yourself for college so much. There's, there's nothing like the real thing. Being in game action is not the same as being in seven on seven thud or even a full live scrimmage. It's the real deal. Maybe something at Oregon didn't click for him. It may not even be something athletically. It could be socially. Who knows? Again, we're dealing with college kids here, teenagers, I mean, I'm nowhere near that age anymore, but I remember that my mind was all over the place. I had no consistency then either. I'm sure Cole's better than I was, but I wouldn't worry about it from a perspective of they didn't prepare him right or they didn't do something right. Oregon's football program is in tune. I mean, it's a national top 10 program. Highly doubt it's an Oregon problem here. That's the way I feel as well. But my next thought was, well, what does this mean for the Ducks secondary going into next year? Because there are a lot of losses, whether you look at Triquez Bridges or, uh, you know, Damon David coming off of the depth chart, Brian Addison no longer there, no Steve Stevens, no uh, Evan Williams next year for the Ducks. Of course, you add Kobe Savage, the transfer from Kansas State. But Still, I looked at Cole Martin as someone who who played meaningful snaps this year and was kind of at the top of the list whenever mop-up duty came into play for the Ducks. He was on special teams regularly this year. It looked like he had all the makings of a guy who was poised to take a sophomore leap given his recruiting profile, his talent, his association with his dad as a defensive backs coach. But this is a guy who is really talented and has looked good in everything that he has done now he's going elsewhere, and I think that bringing this back to recruiting, broadly speaking, Brian, it shows the importance of bringing in as much talent as possible in the portal world because you just don't know who's going to leave. Last year, Keith Brown was a big surprise for the Ducks. This year, Cole Martin's a little bit of a surprise. Dante Dowdell, I think, was a bit of a surprise addition to the transfer portal. 
You just don't know, even if you can see the stars aligning for how this guy plays, pops, and is an all-conference player for your team, it just can always go in a different direction. It's why you have to continue to, to recruit talented players at every position. I don't know if you've seen the video clip from Kirby Smart right after the game against Florida State, but he went into a diatribe about this is why recruiting is important. Mm -hmm. The NCAA has screwed this up, meaning like we beat the bejesus out of Florida State, but it was more the NCAA screwing Florida State than anything else. And uh, that's that's true. But to your point about recruiting, you, you have to look at it from a worst case scenario. You don't know who's going to leave, but you have to assume at every position something wrong is going to happen. And in the next class, you have another elite player, which Dan and his staff have done. I'm not saying it's good to lose a corner. Don't get me wrong. But they will be better than most teams because he was with a certain Kirby Smart not too long ago. And that's why he ended up ascending. He actually takes on recruiting from that perspective. You have to be ready for attrition. Portal is included in recruiting now. They're all but one and the same. If you don't have a couple of these a year, you would be the oddball school. That's what's weird about it. Like Georgia's lost a couple of kids. They had a guy that was an SEC linebacker, like, and he transferred to Kentucky. You started. He was a How starting player Kentucky? for Georgia this year, and he transferred to Kentucky. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for an instance like that, just off the top of my head, maybe he sees the writing on the wall and thinks, I'm not going to play – in a big way next year. I, I mean, I, I, I don't he know. He was borderline all SEC. Like he was a top five inside linebacker in the league. And, and Georgia's had a lot of kids this year yeah. leave who were highly touted recruits. But That's Georgia, right. of course, we all know is going to be fine because they recruit at such a high level. They're going to replace, you know, this former high four or five star kid with another high four or, or, or five star kid. So that's just the reality of the world that Oregon's living in right now. And I think when, you know, you talk about the transfer portal, a lot of time the conversations will drift into, well, does high school recruiting even matter? I, I think an example like Cole Martin here shows that, that it absolutely does. So um, do, do you have any final thoughts on that? Well, the, the only other thing is with, with Kirby's comments, and this is why I think Oregon will be better than most, they used the portal to supplement, not to be the substance. Florida State had too many guys that were there for themselves, and there's just no nice way to say it. And Kirby kind of hinted at that part of it in part of the soundbite, and that's what he was taking the shot at, the, you know, at the NCAA. You know, open transfer does not work. It just doesn't. Because everybody's moving around and it's caused chaos. But well, and it, it, it's the it's the calendar, it's the timeline of it. You know, you you can make the case that having unlimited transfers, it's not good. It's not all this this sort of stuff. Like I'm I'm open to that particular discussion. The fundamental underlying problem when you have the transfer portal in play is that it opens right before bowl season, before national signing day. Like the schedule in college football is so backwards there is no inherent logic from a financial standpoint from a player standpoint from a coaches teams fans nobody benefits from this schedule and the response i i think is the driving force behind it is well they have to get enrolled at their new school it's all you know the academics are good that's it, you relatively speaking the number of transfers that would come in during a certain window you could make these there are a lot of people that work in compliance within athletics, in college athletic departments. If you wanted to make this work, you could absolutely make it work. But you just have to have a governing body that's got the will and the power to act on it. And that's what college football lacks. It's it's the same thing with, you know, bowl games or the structure or just a whole, whole, whole host of issues. You could do it, but you have to have someone overseeing it to enforce it. And that's what we're missing. Well, the, the government has also signed off on a petition somewhere, Kentucky or whatever, that you could transfer more than once. That did not help. So I don't know if you saw that, but that once I, did I got not passed, see that. Yeah, it's a law. And I was like, oh boy, that's not good. Yeah, when, when, once you get once you get the government's involved, then it, it just gets it just gets even messier. College sports in quite the quite the state of flux right now. You might hear that statement a lot from from broadcasters or podcasters all over the place. People keep saying it because it just continues to be true. And this is just, it just continues uh, to, to rear its head in that sense. But Brian has got stories, or yes, so he says.
I've got a story for all of you. It's that time that the little boy went to LinkedIn, he posted his job and then got a bunch of great applicants. Boom, the end, greatest story ever. At the start of the new year, every small business owner is asking themselves the same question. What's the one move I can make that'll take my business to the next level in 2024? LinkedIn Jobs knows that your success depends on the team you surround yourself with. That's why LinkedIn Jobs has created the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. Small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality candidates and quality hires versus leading competitors. With LinkedIn, the process is intuitive, quick, and easy. So go post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. LinkedIn, by the way, our recruiting sponsor here at the Locked On Podcast Network as we continue along with Brian Smith, our Locked On Recruiting Insider. So you uh, texted me during the week that you had some stories, Brian. So you can start with Aiden Breeland, Oregon's five-star defensive line commit on the interior in the 2024 cycle, who <laughs> did sign uh, with the Ducks on the early signing day. So uh, you say you have stories. The floor is yours, good sir. All right, Aiden Breeland, defensive tackle. Uh, he's 287 right now. He was at one point, he told me, when he was a freshman, he was 330. So this is a kid that's changed his diet. Wow. Yeah, that's a big kid as a freshman. That's a lot of weight. That's a lot of cookies. So um, the cookies have went away, and uh, he's in much better shape. He looks pretty good, to be honest. He's down here at Under Armour in Orlando. He's playing well. Uh, good hand use. He's quick off the ball. He can do different things, play one tech, three tech. He's going to play early. He, he's a really good football player. The interesting part, though, is I said, I took my phone, and he was sitting at a table, a bunch of us, you know, get a big scrum interviewing the kid. I was the last one there. I said, okay, I'm going to put my phone away. Now it's time to just kind of like, what, what really happened here? And he told me he could have went to any of the schools. But at the end, it wasn't NIL or any of that. He said, Oregon just did a great job recruiting me. And he said his grandmother wanted him to stay closer to home so she didn't have to fly to go see him. Pretty simple and pretty humble stuff. And that was kind of cool. You don't hear that kind of stuff very often anymore. Uh, he made a family decision. I'm I'm down with that. So give me all those I can get. Uh, and he said that quite honestly, I, I got this from McClellan, who I'll talk about in a second as well. He said NIL came up last. He said the staff at Oregon just did a really good job of recruiting him. And I've heard that from a lot of kids. So I wasn't shocked. Again, Kirby didn't hire Dan Lanning to run the defense. That was sec that was part two. It's to recruit. You got to get players. If you haven't heard the sound by Kirby said it point blank, you can have all the scheme you want. It's not going to beat great players. And Kirby, you know scheme. Okay. And Lanning does too. But that this is why. So so and, can I can I play just devil's advocate for for one moment? Do you think there is anything to the idea that kids are out there, you know, publicly stating to someone like you or any other media outlet, you know, NIL was a consideration, but not a big consideration. Do you think any of that is media coach speak, you know, trying not to portray a certain image of, of college recruiting right now? Some kids do. Um, I talked to Breland enough and he offered enough stuff. I'm not going to give away the whole conversation, but he offered enough. Like he, he gave me information that I didn't ask for. So when you get unsolicited info, you know, this from like doing baseball and everything else, that's when the red light goes on. I was like, okay, this is the different section. Why would you give me that? And he mentioned it. He's like, you know, yeah, NIL is something, but it, it wasn't as big a deal as some made it out to be. The mom, or excuse me, the grandma thing was a big deal to him, which is cool. I, I'm down with that. And I, again, I don't get those kind of stories very often. And again, as well, hats off to Lanning and his staff for recruiting the kid because he had offers from coast to coast. Could have went to... USC, Notre Dame, Miami, wherever he wanted, he chose the Ducks. Um, ironically, 10 minutes later, McClellan walked in to our scrum. There was like 100 kids that walked in from the Under Armour at different times when their flights came in. And McClellan told me that he had more opportunities financially at Ohio State than he did Oregon. He just told me he felt more comfortable at Oregon. Uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. He and where's said, McClellan from originally? St. Louis. St. Louis. Yeah, St. Louis. that's right. So, I mean, he has, he's closer there, but I mean, it's still, you know, quite a drive from St. Louis over to Columbus, Ohio. He's a kid that just liked it better um, and decided on it. He said Ohio State kept coming back even after he told him he was decommitting. And, you know, they kept going after him, but he just decided to go play for the Ducks. Now, 
I, I've seen his film enough over the last few years. We knew about him a couple of years ago when he was a sophomore. He was going to be a guy. And I've seen him at Under Armour this week making you know catches, back shoulder fades, and all that kind of stuff. He's a really good receiver. But he's another kid that pointed – it was like the same conversation. They recruited me well. I was comfortable. It's a great pick for me. I'm good. It was almost like the same thing. Two different positions, two different people. But I found that interesting because usually kids are very much in tune just with them, and that's it. So that tells me that Oregon has a plan on how they recruit kids. That's very important. When you're scatterbrained with your efforts as a staff, it does not end well. It does not. Like Kirby's staff, obviously, does good. And I think Dan has basically just made Oregon Georgia West in terms of how they, they recruit because they seem to be in sync. And, and that's really important. So I, I think Oregon has more to offer than what I had originally thought. And I've never been to their campus. So it's, I'm guessing, I mean, I know you probably know it like the back of your hand, but this is a good sign because when kids come from that far away, like LA is still a long way from Eugene, St. Louis is real far. And they're that comfortable. That tells me, especially with the, with the added exposure of the big 10, you're going to have a chance to be a consistently high level program this is okay well we got bo nicks he was the icing on top that made this work and it was but if you're recruiting like this year in and year out like an eight one an eight win season is a major disappointment moving forward that's how i would look at it, barring you know like your quarterback getting hurt in game two or something this should be a nine or ten win season every single year bottom end you're recruiting like this duck fans should have a lot of fun so McRoy is, is the final piece to this. Um, for those of you that don't know, I met him when he was a freshman in high school. He was 360. And when he walked up to me and the coach told me he was a freshman, I won't repeat what I said to the coach on air, but uh, I didn't believe him. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't have either. I've seen some big freshmen. I haven't seen 360 pounders. When he walked up, I was concerned I was going to be today's Big Mac. So <laughs> it was just a difficult situation to imagine him because that day I'm like, he's not going to be able to make it, but he's changed his body a little bit. Hasn't really changed anything other than just power. But you no, know, when Ari, the kid that Oregon and everybody recruited, there's a play in pass protection where he took an inside move when Ari did and McCroy just, you know what? I'm just going to go like this. And he just crushed him. I've never seen that on a pass rush play in my life. It looked like an avalanche fell onto a person because you couldn't even see when Ari McCroy, I thought he killed him. And uh, that was one of the most unique plays I've ever seen in my life in wow. any sport. I, I, it'll be on on YouTube forever. So it is what it is. Yeah. So I've I've seen that buzzing around, and and I've seen a lot of clips buzzing around. I've seen some from Jeremiah McClellan. I've seen the one of McCroy that you're talking about, pancaking Williams Winery, a guy that Oregon was after once upon a time, number one overall defensive lineman in the 2024 class. What, what exactly has been going on? Can you fill people in on kind of what these Under Armour kind of camps, get-togethers, what they are, and also, more importantly, what they really mean right now? This is the All-Star game. Every year, the top players in the country go to one or two All-Star games, and Under Armour is one of them, and players from coast to coast come. Hawaii to New York, Chicago to Miami, you, the elite players. And they put them in two teams. Under Armour, it's fire and ice, you know, whatever – and they just go out and they compete against you. It's very evenly matched. And they do one-on-ones every day. There's no hiding because everybody's around the field with, with these things called cell phones, video cameras, TV crews. You get cockroached like when Ari did, and he got cockroached. It's out there forever. Um, guys catching the ball with one hand, catching it for touchdowns. It is elite on elite. There's no hiding. There's no evaluation there. You won or you lost a rep. And we count them. There, and that's it. Like the media members sit there and we like, I'm talking to John Garcia standing next to me. Okay. Well, this guy won this rep. This guy won this rep. You know, Mc, McClellan's beaten some elite DBs. He's not just beating some scrub from St. Louis, some public school. These, the guy next to him is going to an SEC or big 10 school. That's when, you know, kids are good. Some guys cower. Like they come to these kind, kind of levels and there's like, eh, they don't make it. There's a few guys I won't mention that are really highly ranked. I'm like, yeah, he's not as good as we thought. They're not doing as well. McRoy, I was kind of wondering, he's better than I thought because when he gets his hands on somebody, it kind of looks like one of the giants in Game of Thrones when he gets his hands on somebody. Like the, like the, the mountain. Yes. yes. Yeah, he's like, he's like the mountain. 
uh, Gre- uh, Gregor Clegane, I think was I think is the name of the mountain from from Game of Thrones. I haven't I haven't seen that particular season in, in quite a while. Love love Game of Thrones, fantastic show. So the fact that you worked that seamlessly into today's show, Brian, is is once again a testament to your just top notch ability as as a guest here. But I still got a couple more things that that I want to ask you. The first one is the season that Oregon just had. They go 12-2, and two, only two losses to Washington, who's playing Monday night in the national championship game. Those two losses by a combined six points. It was painful both times for Duck fans. But when, when Washington goes on to have that sort of success and you see how Oregon played against them uh, uh, this year, and Oregon's got the 12-win season, they dominate Liberty in the Fiesta Bowl, everything like that, what sort of impact – is this campaign for Oregon when taken in, in its totality having on kind of the impression surrounding the Ducks as they go into the Big Ten, specifically on the recruiting front? I think they're right where they need to be. I think they're ahead of schedule. They got, if you look at it from, I, I said this to Garcia the other day, I said, you could make the argument when you take the portal and combine it with the recruiting because they're, they're heavy at spots they need to be, D line, for instance. They got not one but two portal quarterbacks at different ages. They're only one to really hit the home run there. They should be competitive in the Big Ten from year one, competing for the title from year one. Dante Moore, I had as the number one recruit, period, coming out of high school for a reason. He was a dude. He'll take over in year two that he's in on, on campus. What's not to like? You know what I mean? And everybody saw them be this close to making it. They're going to get more exposure in the Big Ten, a lot more. I grew up in Big Ten country. There's nothing here but corn. They're going to come watch the games. You're going to be on TV in front of a lot of kids on the East Coast, et cetera. They're already recruiting there well. They're going to get it even more. It's free exposure. I'm sure Dan is all about it. I think Oregon is in about as advantageous a spot as you can be based on the location of the institution itself. And the way he works, and based on what I just told you a little bit ago, McClellan, Breland, look, they figured it out. They've got a blueprint. This is how we do it. Why would you not think this is not a top 10 program moving forward? Back-to-back 10-win seasons for Dan Lanning. He's got a couple of, uh, of bowl wins. He's got a couple of top 10 recruiting classes as well. I think it is pretty easy to look at the outset or look at it from the outset and say, yeah, that the things look uh, really, really good. I think one thing that that popped into my head while you were talking was the Dante Moore factor and how that kind of plays into high school and portal recruiting. Because a lot of times you hear on the high school front specifically, but it can certainly happen in the transfer portal now, a quarterback comes in and other guys follow. And they say, I want to go play for that guy. I want to play for this guy. What, what do you make of Oregon bringing in Dylan Gabriel and then bringing in Dante Moore to basically you know, be able to assure recruits, hey, we're, we're going to have – what we believe to be high-level quarterback play for the next two years at least. I would imagine that probably help with guys like McClellan, et cetera. Look, there's no two positions tied like receiver and quarterback in any sport. I mean, you can have Jerry Rice in his prime, but if your quarterback is just no good, he's mitigated. So, yeah, I think it's going to help them a lot. And you don't have to get five five stars every year, but if you get one elite receiver every year and you take a few developmental guys and you coach them up, you'll be fine. And again, their exposure is going up. I expect them to get at least one four star, if not a couple, every year pretty much across the board at any spot. But when you got Dante Moore sitting over here as your backup, how many schools can make that claim? They have something of that nature. Three, four maybe in the country? Ohio State is one. Georgia's got some depth. But Georgia Bama probably have depth right now. No, Bama does not. The Florida schools, none of them do. Like Michigan is in trouble. Penn State is iffy. Like it, it's Texas is the only. Yeah, other I don't know. I don't, I don't know how many people can say they've got you know a, a incoming sixth year transfer at quarterback who just went for over thirty six hundred yards and threw for thirty touchdowns, ran for twelve, and then have the number one uh, recruit at his position being quarterback, of course, from the previous cycle, uh, waiting waiting in the wings to take the reins there. I, I think that's a pretty unique uh, situation here. 
I want to end with this question that came in from a listener, Brian. YouTube comments are always available. Twitter comments always open. Uh, DMs also wide open. If you want priority access, go join the Locked On Ducks subtext community. But this question came from uh, M caught me two nine seven seven. I don't know. He's doing a deep dive here on you, Brian. Pulling this one out from uh, left field a little bit. Ask Brian who got the better defensive line class between Oregon in Miami. I wonder why he picked Miami. He said Miami could have the best 24, uh, 2024 defensive line class. I want him to co- compare and contrast what we got. What was it about Miami's defensive line class, and how do you feel that that compares to what Oregon uh, hauled in this year? They're pretty similar. They both try to just bring in a lot of guys, let it fall where it does, because somebody's going to leave, right? I mean, there, there's too many guys. Somebody's going to leave. And they've embraced it. We already talked about that earlier in the show. So his question is actually very apt for what we're doing here. You got to expect bad things to happen. First guy you talk about, the kid, his dad is freaking DB coach. Cole Martin, You never know who's leaving. You just don't. You've got Justin Scott came in. I'll see you from Oregon side with Aiden Breland. There's a kid that Miami got that led the state of Alabama in sacks. in Cole McConnell, he had 24 and a half. He's one of three elite pass rushers they got. He's the third guy, ranking swap. Their D-line class is one of the greatest I've ever seen. But at the same time, you look at Oregon's group, athletically, the kid they got from, from Arizona, I mean, like, what? They, there is no way you can say to me that one is definitively better than the other. You talking about like, Elijah rushing I mean, in there? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Rushing can go play for anybody. I mean, he, he would have went in and played at Ohio State. He would have went in and played it, but Penn State might have had the best defense of the country. If he'd have went there, he'd have played next year. He's a good football player. He's going to Oregon. That's the kind of guy that Miami got. They got a few guys like that, too. I think rushing is just bigger and stronger, maybe a little more ready than some of the guys Miami got. They got three of them, though. I'm just curious to see which guys pick up the mental part of it because athletically, you like if you put on huddle for either team, whether it's tackle or whether it is on the edge, there are no bad players. It's going to be who figures it out mentally because these it's going to be swarms. Teams win, like Georgia, again, back to Kirby's comment, it's about numbers, man. That third quarter, fourth quarter, we got more guys than you, you're in trouble. Oregon and Miami's D-lines are great. I would go with Miami because I know that group better from like talking to some of these kids. I don't know Oregon's as well, but, I mean, I've seen a lot of them on film. They're great too. Yeah, and I think Oregon has got a lot of guys that – are coming back from the 2023 class that are going to be redshirt freshmen. The Amari Washingtons, uh, you know, Amari Washington played a good amount in the Fiesta Bowl against Liberty, the Ashton Porters, the Terrence Greens of the world, Michael Gardner, like all all those guys who were notable four-star recruits in the 2023 cycle. I think that is going to be one of the most fascinating things to watch in, in spring football is which of those guys emerge, you know, Breland, obviously you and everybody else are very, very high on. Is he going to be a plug and play sort of guy is he going to be able to beat out everybody else that's there on the interior of the defensive line because there isn't really that much experience up front there's a lot of talent but there's not a lot of experience so i think uh the opportunity will will be there we'll leave it there uh, for today brian smith is our locked on recruiting insider here at the network he's at fb scout underscore florida on x formerly known as twitter brian fantastic fantastic stuff today thanks as always thank you sir Appreciate everyone listening. I will see you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And as always, go Ducks.